Hey, welcome to Well Made. My name is Kat Kamalani. Here we dive deep into topics like wellness, food, money, relationships, motherhood, and achieving your wildest dreams. Because I promise, if I can do it, I know you can too. We sit with experts and get into the nitty gritty where they spill all their secrets with me. So get cozy, relax, and let's have a heart-to-heart chat. All right, Haley, welcome to Well Made. In case you guys don't know Haley, she has the most inspiring podcast ever, Girls Camp Podcast. She talks a lot about being inside the LDS church and organized religion and deconstructing that. So I could not think of anyone else that was perfect for this episode besides you. So I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. That was a very sweet intro and I love talking about this topic. So I can't wait. (laughs) Okay. Tell our viewers kind of your background with organized religion, being born, your childhood, and then where you are today. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So I was born and raised Mormon. I lived in Provo, Utah, which is very, very heavily populated, excuse me, by Mormons. So it was really just I always say the air I breathed was Mormon. It was just part of my DNA, my identity, my family culture, the community. And it was that way for me all the way through high school. I ended up going on a Mormon mission. I served a mission in Berlin, Germany for 18 months, which is crazy to think about now. Yeah. And then got home for my mission, got married very shortly after that in the temple And it was around 2020 during COVID that I say I officially stepped away from the church. As you know, anybody who has deconstructed religion, it's a very drawn out process, I think. So it's kind of difficult to say exactly when the leaving took place. But that is when both my husband and I decided to stop attending church and you know, since then have just been deconstructing and unpacking and talking about it. I can relate to that so much because I was born and raised in the LDS church too. And my whole life, I was just like a faithful follower. And you touched base on like saying, leaving the church, there's not this like one specific moment. Cause a lot of people ask me that too. Like, when did you leave the church? And I can't think of a time where it was all of a sudden I left the church for me. I always said, I am about 90% Mormon and then I'm a 70% Mormon and 30%. And then finally, after maybe a year or two, I realized like, okay, I don't think anything I believe in or any values or beliefs that I have align with the LDS church anymore. And I have to deprogram myself and figure out what I do learn. And I always say it's the Yoda effect that I have to unlearn what I've learned in order to deprogram and move forward with my life. Yeah, absolutely. I feel similarly. You realize by the time you decide to officially leave that you've kind of been doing that deconstruction, that deprogramming percentage by percentage. I like the way that you laid that out because I think that's how it was for me too, where there was a moment when my husband and I were discussing just kind of where we were where we were at with the church. And we were talking about, we didn't have kids yet. And so we were talking about, you know, what are we going to teach our kids and are we going to take them to church? And I realized, oh, I don't think it will be in line with what we want for our family to bring our children to church where certain things are being taught. And in that moment, we kind of realized, oh, well then why would we go to church if we're not going to bring our future kids to church? Oh my gosh, we've kind of left Mormonism without even realizing that this is how far we had gotten down that path. But I definitely relate to that. I think it's a very kind of piece by piece unraveling, if you will. There's a difference with being in an organized religion and leaving the organized religion in my eyes with crisis in your life versus deconstructing what you believe in your thought process. So for example, I think somebody back in college, I was faithful Mormon and I started to experiment as any college kid does with alcohol. And I remember there's three months that I was drinking and I finally went through this, like, I want to say identity crisis, but 
what am I doing? I should not be drinking alcohol. This is so wrong. And I felt like I was towards rock bottom and I needed to come back to the church and refine Jesus and God in order to be healed and to be a faithful servant. And that is when I came back to the church after like a three month of like, I'm stepping away versus being 32. Now it's not this faith crisis of who I am an identity crisis of who I am. It's more like, I'm so confident in myself and I love my life and I know who I am, even though I'm still learning, but it's deconstructing of what the church is and peeling the onions back of an organized religion and questioning things that I realized, okay, I would never go back to this because that does not serve me. And I understand the principles now and realize like it's not in line with me. Absolutely. I think there's a really big difference in my mind between just stopping going to church or starting to do things that are against the commandments versus deconstructing. And I think deconstructing is a much more intentional, oftentimes harder. There's a lot of work that comes with that because you have to really look at who am I? What do I believe? What do I think? How do I want to spend my time? What do I want to eat and drink and wear? It's very involved. And, you know, I think that that process, I'm sure many people would agree who have stepped away from organized religion at any point that there are so many layers of it. It surprises me even still. I left about four years ago and certain things will come up and I think, oh yeah, I haven't really thought about how I feel about this certain thing outside of just what I was taught to believe in the church. And then I kind of have to deconstruct that piece. And yeah, I I just absolutely agree that there is, in my eyes, a big difference from stepping away or experimenting versus really deconstructing, deprogramming, all of that. In my eyes, the blueprint to life and learning wisdom is the steps of, okay, I'm going to live life. And then the second step, I'm going to make mistakes. The third step is I'm going to learn from those mistakes. And then the fourth step is I'm going to question what I learned from those mistakes and realize maybe the wisdom that I learned from that is not wisdom at all. And then the fifth step is I'm going to just keep repeating that. And that is how I grow and evolve as a person and learn what serves me and what's not serving me, what is bringing me peace and happiness or what's bringing me fear and what am I, how am I living my life on these actions? Do you agree with that or? (laughs) Yeah, totally. No, totally. I, I really like that perspective too, because I was talking with somebody the other day and they said that they really struggle because they also left the organized religion of their upbringing. And they were saying, sometimes I feel like my whole life until I left was a sham. I feel like I wasn't being my true self. I feel a little betrayed by the religion, by people in the religion. And I think that's such a relatable feeling when you leave an organized religion. However, I like to look at it as just what you described of I was doing my best with the tools I had, the spiritual tools, with the community I was around. And I guess I'm just saying, I don't think you have to throw everything out when you leave religion. I found a lot of peace in implementing certain things that I gained from Mormonism into my life now. And just looking at that, looking at it more as you described of building on things. A lot of people I've talked to call it a spiritual expansion as a, as opposed to a spiritual crisis. And I think that's a really nice way of, of that same thing, right? Instead of looking at things that you might now do differently as, oh, that's just a mistake. What a bummer. You can look at it as, oh, I can learn and grow from that and change and recorrect, but still be kind of honoring that past, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Have you gotten the question of people talking to you and they have this misconception of when you leave an organized religion that you're going through like quote unquote crisis and crisis, I feel like has a negative connotation to it where in actuality for me, it's almost magical and it's kind of exciting and fun, especially when I have a partner that's going through the same thing as me, but it's 
I was talking with my little girl, Luna, and we were talking about Jesus and all of that stuff. And then she said to me like, well, mom, like, what if I want to be a mermaid or a butterfly when I die? Like, what if I just don't want to go to heaven? And my first reaction was to say like, oh no, that's not what happens. Like you go to, you go up to heaven and we're going to be together forever. And like default to what I've learned. But then like, I challenged those thoughts and I was like, yeah, like what if that happens? Like, what if you do become a butterfly or like, what if you do something and that like felt good in that moment? And it was really fun. And so I I feel like people who are in, in an organized religion, they think it's so scary, which it can be, but it's almost like magical expanding that thought process. Have you gotten that? Yeah, totally. And I feel similarly. I think, you know, the thing is with religion and a lot of spirituality is it's built on this concept of faith. So no one really, really knows for sure. You know, you'll find people in all religions who say, well, we know the truth 100%, but nobody actually knows if we're going to go to this idea of heaven or if we're going to be mermaids and butterflies. You know, we don't know for sure. And so, I feel spiritually much more full and it is much more exciting to me to be able to explore options and to wonder about things. And I have found that to be a really beautiful spiritual practice in and of itself, as opposed to what I feel like was my experience with religion where you have all the answers and they're very prescriptive and they're very specific. And there's certainly a comfort in that, I think, but I, I agree with you. And I think a lot of people do too, that it feels really exciting to allow your mind and your soul to wonder about these things that for a lot of us for a long time, we were just told, no, sorry, this is the way it is. And that might have been less spiritually satisfying for many of us. I want to get to like the nitty gritty with you. If you want to get down there, yeah, I want to talk about some subjects that you personally had to really, really deprogram yourself and really challenge your thought process. Every time you had a thought, like what are some subjects to you that mm-hmm. come to mind? Ooh, that's a really good question. Honestly, I think at every step of the journey, like almost everything I had to go through that. I think that one of them that comes to mind for me, you were talking earlier about experimenting with drinking. And that was a really hard one for me and still is in some ways with, you know, in the Mormon church, you have the word of wisdom. So you are not supposed to drink coffee. You're not supposed to drink alcohol. I also have addiction in my family. And so... I've always found that one a really interesting thing to find a balance on still to this day because I really enjoy the freedom of making decisions about what I eat and drink for myself. However, I also understand that substances can be potentially dangerous or that there are at least implications or things to consider. You need to be responsible if you're using alcohol, for example. And so that's something that, you know, if I'm having a drink one night, I'll still find myself thinking, oh, am I feeling guilt and shame about this? Or am I feeling a responsible adult thing kick in of, hey, you're maybe not going to feel so great in the morning or just, you know, a normal responsible thought of just making sure I'm being aware about alcohol, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think that's been a tricky one for me because, you know, with coffee, for for example, I think now that that rule is just pretty silly. So it's like, whatever, I'm going to drink coffee if I want to drink coffee. I don't, I don't feel anything. Exactly. Tea. Tea, like not a problem. But I think with alcohol, that's just been an interesting one that I still am kind of parsing out how much of it is programmed guilt and shame, which I don't want versus how much of it is just a self-awareness of my own health and, you know, my own life goals and my own awareness. It can be, it can be really complicated. Yes. And I can relate to that because I always say matcha is one of the starting points that I had with leaving the church because I'm so into food and nutrition and 
I truly do believe in a God and Jesus. And we, I believe they did create everything here on this earth. And so I could not wrap my head around of, I don't understand how matcha is this super powerful antioxidant. It's not addictive, but yeah, I couldn't get a temple recommend drinking something God created that's organic from the earth versus a man-made chemical that was an energy drink that is addictive that can put you in the hospital with heart defects. And that to me was like the start of like questioning things. Mm, I th- yeah. I think also too, for me with deprogramming and I, um, it's hard for me to talk about this because I'm actually like really embarrassed about it. Oh, I did not expect to get emotional. And yeah, I'm embarrassed because, you know, I, it is what I was grown up thinking that gay marriage was wrong. And I remember I was in college and I was doing photo shoots and wedding photography to make a living. And I had a gay couple come to me and want me to shoot their photos. And at the time I was struggling for money. I, there, I couldn't even pay for groceries. I had my brothers like Venmoing, not Venmoing, but dropping money into my account, money to get groceries. And so at the time they came to me and they were offering me $3,000 for a package, which is a crap ton of money first off. And it's a crap ton of money to someone who has no money and can't even pay for their own groceries. And I remember just thinking that this is wrong. Like there's no way I could shoot two people who are gay and put this up and support this because you shouldn't be doing it. And I, I'm so embarrassed, but like I turned it down and I wish there was something, a way I could find that couple again and just apologize and say, I'm sorry. I just like did some lie that I was busy, but it goes back to, um, Kehlani's brother, little brother was gay and very involved in the LDS church and he died by suicide. And Mm. he believed that not being here was better than being gay. And, um, it really did change the way I thought and my whole thought process about people just wanting to be loved and they want to feel safe and they want to feel accepted. We all want to feel that. And it shouldn't matter who we loved, but that was a moment that I realized like, what am I doing? And am I going to program my kids to think this way too? And I was mortified that I ever thought that way. Just to be clear, like, I don't think that way. And I just, I don't know. No, I really appreciate you sharing that. And something I've been sort of reckoning with myself, I I have a super close friend. We were best friends for our whole life since third grade. He ended up coming out as gay and he left the church about a year or two before I did. And it actually broke off our friendship. We had to stop talking to each other because my activity in the church was just he couldn't reconcile it because the church had caused him as a gay person so much harm. And I have found a significant part of my deconstruction is also just taking accountability for the fact that while I was a member, I did and said harmful things. And it's it's a tricky thing because in the same breath, I know that I'm a good person. I know that you're a phenomenally good, caring, inclusive person. And I think that that to me just speaks to the harm that certain doctrines of the church and of many religions can really do because I think people naturally are inclusive and kind and generous (laughs) with their love and not as judgmental as many people are. And I think sometimes religion can really draw people away from those parts of themselves. And I feel like that happened for me where I think back to where I was at when my friend came out as gay and I just was defensive, right? I was defensive about my faith. And I know why I was that way. I had, I thought it was my eternal salvation on the line. And that's where it gets really complicated you know, I could dig into all of that, but I do think it's important to take accountability and say, you know, I, I could have been better and I should have been better, but the beautiful, wonderful thing is that we get to do better now. And I, I just really appreciate you speaking to that because 
I think there's also a thing that sometimes happens in post-religious spaces where people leave religion and then think, oh, I'm enlightened and now I cause no harm and I, I'm not sexist or racist or homophobic at all. But really, I think it takes a lot of active work to undo a lot of that programming, both from religion and just from society at large. Yeah. Have you read the book, um, Adam Grant? I think it's called Think Again. No, I absolutely need to. I love Adam Grant, but I have not read the book. Oh my gosh. The way I, every single person listening to this needs to go and read that book, whether you are in a religion or not, it really does open up your mindset on the way you think and challenging yourself. And in that book, he talks about there is no way to ever possibly grow unless you challenge those thoughts that you have. And it can be something as simple as like the blue sky, like the sky is blue, but when you start challenging those thoughts and you look at it and like, yes, the sky is blue, but the sky is also orange and pink and purple. And it's all these different colors and it becomes way more beautiful when you can start challenging those thoughts. And it, like you said, it, it, you have to actively be challenging those thoughts every single time in order to grow as a human. And that's the beauty of it is that you get to sit and say, this serves me and I like it and it feels good and I'm going to keep this. And then if it doesn't, you can say, you know what, this isn't serving me. And I'm going to, I'm going to kindly let it go without anger or hatred, even though those feelings are very valid and just set it aside and start to move on with your life. Mm, Yeah. I love that. I, I feel like of all the things I believe now, I consider myself quite agnostic, but one thing that I can say I believe 100% is that it is very, very, very crucial to continually challenge our beliefs for that very same reason you said. Because again, with post-religious spaces, oftentimes I see people becoming just as dogmatic in their thinking as ex-religious people as they were when they were religious. And to me, so much of the joy of stepping away from religion is that you don't have to be right about everything. You get to not be right. And you can actually find a lot of learning and growth and joy in asking yourself, wait, am I right on this? Maybe I'm not. Or maybe there's different opinions. And that's not to say that you know I'm just floating around with no opinions or values. I definitely have those things. But I do think to what you were saying with Adam Grant, that that continual challenging is really, really helpful in so many ways. It's an ego check, like checking your ego at the door and realizing like, okay, well, unless you're a narcissist, you can't really do this. But if you're not a narcissist, I think everyone has that space where they can check your ego at the door and realize I may not have all the answers and other people may not have all the answers. And it's okay to challenge that. I also want to pivot and talk about another subject and that is sex. And this was a big one for me being in an organized religion and being a Mormon is that growing up and jump in if you can relate at all or have anything to add, but growing up, it was such a hard concept to get married and understand that like, it's okay to have sex because growing up the whole time, I thought having those desires that God put onto us and created our bodies the way it's supposed to be was bad. And we shouldn't be having that. And then it started to get to like, okay, well, do I really want my daughter being in a room with a 70 year old man telling details of things that she did sexually with whoever? Is that even like his business? And that seems highly inappropriate to be by herself as a minor saying those things. And then it was that switch of like, okay, I'm married. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. Yesterday, like I was not able to have sex and I would have been what it's called, like probably damned to hell. It's the next sin greatest to what murder. Murder, Yeah. And now like I'm a okay to do that. And I feel like there's a lot of issues with marriages of like having that flip and where they can't connect on a certain level because it was redeemed bad one time and a sin next to murder. 
Totally. I hear this all the time. I feel this myself. I was talking about those layers that come up that you realize down the road when you think, oh, I've kind of moved on. And then you realize, wait, I think there's still something here. I think sex is a huge one for me. And it makes so much sense because sex was always, in my experience, I I feel like so many lessons as an adolescent were about sex and how, as you said, sinful it was to not even be having sex, but to have sexual desires or to experience sexual pleasure, whether with someone else or on your own. And you have it really deeply ingrained that that is a shameful, sinful thing. And unfortunately, our brains don't just flip a switch when we get married or when we leave a religion. And I've talked to a lot of people, women especially, who have so much baggage around sex that it's really difficult for them to feel in touch with themselves sexually because there's so many layers of the shame that just gets really automatically triggered around sex stuff specifically. When you grew up, when you were growing up, did your parents talk to you about sex, your body, like have those detailed conversations with you? Hardly at all. Did Mm. yours? No, they never did. And I think that's probably one of the dangers around it is that it's this taboo thing where people don't talk about, you don't speak about it. You don't talk about it. And I can almost relate it to, and this is probably a silly analogy, but that's, this is the way my brain works Mm. is that with my daughter, it's, I think about taking her, we're living in Utah we're going to go to Hawaii and there's this big, huge ocean with big waves. And I think there's two things you can either do. You can either say the ocean is very bad. You don't ever get to the ocean and we're not talking about a single thing and we're going to go there. You can look at it, but you're not going near it. You're not doing that. And we're not going to talk about it. Or I can describe her, you know, the ocean can be dangerous. Like if you get into it and you don't know what you're doing, that can be super dangerous But it's also a very, very beautiful thing when you learn about the ocean and you understand the healing properties of the ocean, things that it can do for you, not do for you. And you are in control of your body and your thoughts. And when you are ready to step into the ocean to experience this beautiful thing, it is amazing and it's powerful. And it's a very, I would say it can be a spiritual thing. So there's two ways to look at it. It's like, we can talk about it, look at it as a positive thing that you will one day experience this. And I'm hoping and preparing you that when you do experience it, it's going to be beautiful. And it's not this big, scary monster. And we're not going to talk about it. And you're not going to experience that at all because that can go down a very, very dangerous, dangerous road with SA or addictions or anything of that sort. Totally. I love that analogy so much too, because if you're thinking about it like the ocean, the ocean isn't inherently bad. There's nothing about sex that I think is bad, but I do think you have to be educated and be safe. And similar to enjoying the ocean, you need to understand, you need to have the education to be able to be safe. And I think sex is the same way where the messaging I got around sex was it felt like at least sex is really bad until you're married. It didn't feel like sex is beautiful and wonderful and complicated and multifaceted. Let's talk about it. Let's learn about it. Let's learn about what it means to have sex with someone and how emotions get involved, how to be physically safe. That would have been so much better. And I think that analogy works super well for also showing how you can teach about sex in a way that's not just, you know, go jump in the ocean, you're going to be fine. I think sometimes people think you're going to swing that way if you leave organized religion or that sort of framework around sex. But I actually think you can teach just as powerfully. This is a, a really powerful thing that you shouldn't treat lightly, but that doesn't mean that it's inherently bad. Mm, I love that so much. I'm going to pivot because I asked my followers on Instagram 
some questions about organized religion. And so I want to answer them with you if yeah, you're open to it. that. Um, okay. So a fusion explorer said, is it possible to be friends with Mormons without them trying to convert you? I feel like every time I'm around Mormons, they're always trying to talk about their faith and convert me. And I don't know how to handle this. Ooh, interesting. I'm curious what your experience is. I think it's a little different as someone who is part of the faith and then left it. Mm -hmm. I just feel like it's not as much a thing for me because, you know, I knew, I know what Mormonism is. I chose to leave it, but I think it would probably be different for someone who's never been Mormon, maybe as part of a different religion. I think there definitely is a lot of messaging in the Mormon church about being missionaries and ultimately trying to convert to the church. <laughs> yes. And I think too, where the, being in the religion and stepping out, it's you have to realize when you are in an organized religion, you believe that is the truth and only truth and there's nothing else. And in order for you to be saved and go to the highest kingdom, you have to do X, Y, and Z to get there. I don't believe that anymore because when Jesus died, the thing he said on the cross is my work here is done. He didn't say my work here is done and you have to do X, Y, and Z and pay your tithing and then this and that to get to me. But I believe Mormons may have that thinking of they love you. They want you to go to the highest kingdom and go to quote unquote heaven. And that's why they are trying to tell you their belief system so you can come in and experience that happiness and be saved. I don't know. Absolutely. No, I think it comes from a place of love. I do. I think the intention is this makes me happy. This is ultimate salvation. And so I think it comes from love, but that doesn't mean that it can't be probably pretty frustrating. I think though that in my experience too, I do think that anyone who's kind of tried with me as soon as I've just said, you know what, I, I really am, am not interested. I feel like people respond fairly well to an actual boundary. But I think if you leave any crack open in that door, they're going to... A lot of Mormons are probably going to try and wiggle in and, and, and do a little missionary work. <laughs> yes. I had that happen to me when I was talking openly and freely about leaving the church. I had a lot of neighbors keep writing me and wanting to talk to me. And I let them know that I know you're coming from a place of good. And it's like you said, setting a boundary, but I'm not interested in, in you thinking I need my eternal salvation saved. And so it's, I think it's strictly for them rather than the other person. Okay. Amberly Mayfield said, I was LDS, but I stepped away. I am now going down the spiritual journey and I need help. I am Native American with Indian ancestors, and I don't know how to navigate that in a positive way. Mm. So I feel like I can relate to this a lot with the Hawaiian culture. Yeah. So I'm more. I'm curious because I I don't I don't relate in the same way. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay. So in the Hawaiian culture, they believe in a lot of ancestors. It's really heavily believed in that culture that there was the kings and queens here and that there's sacred lands here that that is where the spirits reside. And there's also something called the Amakua in the Hawaiian culture. And the Amakua is the only way I can relate it to is from the movie Mulan, there's that little dragon Mushu who follows Mulan mm -hmm. around and yeah. it guides her and protects her. And so when I was dating Kiloni, he talked about his Amakua, which is a very sacred thing. And it's a tiger shark for his family. And part of his tribal is the shark teeth and the reminder of protection. So Kaloni's aunties and uncles and grandparents would tell me these stories that they would have with tiger sharks in the ocean of like an aunt or a great grandma that at the time being in an organized religion, I could not fathom them at all to be true. I thought there's no, no way because the only spiritual thing is God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And there's no way that these kings and queens, your ancestors or Amakua can protect you because that's not in the Book of Mormon. We don't talk about mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. leaving the organized religion, it was, again, very magical to think 
and expand my thought processes. Yeah, there was a time where there was the King Kamehameha and queens and his ancestors who lived on this land and who are now passed on. And I, it's comforting to know that they had a connection with the ocean that provided with their family. And they also had a connection to the Aina, which is land. And I do believe that they still stay here. And I do believe in Amakua that is our family protector that will protect my children in the ocean. So I just encourage you to Amber, that who asked that is to go down that challenge your thought process, really dive into your culture and heritage and your ancestors and find that what serves you and what doesn't serves you, because it's very comforting with the Hawaiian culture to know there's protection and peace and over our family. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I didn't know any of that. It's really beautiful to, yeah, as you said, expand your thinking around that and I do think just speaking to what we were saying before, leaving the, the the strict frameworks of organized religion, that's so beautiful that you can you know lean into that in a different way and see that differently now. Okay. Last question for you. I could talk literally all day I with know, you same. about this, <laughs> but um, Catherine Hur asks, how do you incorporate your personal beliefs to your children, but allowing them to think for themselves too? I'm struggling with this. Hmm. I will answer. And then I want to hear your answer because my children are almost two, but they're not asking questions yet. Mm, uh, okay. That pertain to spirituality. Yes. However, at my working idea as of right now is to present beliefs to my children. It sounds very similar to your conversation with Luna. I can imagine if one day my daughter says, mom, what happens after we die? I would likely say, hey, this is this is what I think happens after we die. There's a lot of different ideas and people hold different beliefs around where we go and what happens. I would love to explore some of those ideas with you and talk about this more. What do you think happens after we die? Or what sounds nice to you about what happens after we die? And not even to you know, put my beliefs as well, this is what happens or nothing happens or nobody knows and there is nothing because how could we know? Rather look at it as kind of a practice of curiosity and wonder in those same ways that you're saying. And I hope that that too will instill in them a healthy way of also viewing other people's beliefs. My family is still all Mormon. We live in Utah right now. So I'm sure part of that conversation will be, this is what grandma thinks happens after we die. And when they go to church, this is what they're told there. As hopefully a way of showing that different people believe different things. And that's actually really beautiful and can be really wonderful as opposed to frightening or, well, this is what I think. So everybody else must then be wrong. Mm, I love that so much. I am 100% on the same page with you. I've been really careful and being delicate with this subject with her because I do feel like there's not a difference with being in an organized religion and saying, this is what's true. This is what's not true. And putting my beliefs on to Luna. I do believe as her mom that I'm there to guide her and help her along the way, but I'm not there to dictate. I'm not a dictator. Mm -hmm. And so I, me and Kayloni have talked about this and we, we plan to do exactly what you're doing, which I think is a beautiful process, but also really taking a step out in the next few years and showing her and exposing her to travel and the world and other cultures and spiritualities and see, allowing her to have exposure to that and take away what she does love. I love that. It's so cool. It's so exciting to think about. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure this is not everybody's experience growing up within organized religion. But I remember having sort of a fear, I think, of when I encountered other religions or spiritualities or learned about different people believing different things like reincarnation, for example. I remember learning about that and just thinking, well, that's just not what happens though. And it seems really cool to have a different sort of way of seeing things and being able to say, oh, that's really nice. And that seems that 
that feels good to me that that people believe that and maybe I believe that too and I think that's just such a gift to give our children and I love looking to parents like you who have children who are cognizant of those things and you know from a lot of people I've talked to I think children it seems like really enjoy having that curiosity and some of that freedom so it's it's nice to have examples like you who have kids who are in that stage of life and be like, okay, you know, it's scary. It's scary. You don't know what you're going to do or say, and you just want to do right by your kids. But I'm glad to be able to be talking about subjects like this too, because I think it always helps to hear where other people are at with it and how it's going for them. That is a really kind compliment. And I appreciate that so much. If you guys have loved this conversation, Haley has a girls, a podcast called Girls Camp, and she has had many, many episodes of everything that we've talked about going more further in depth. I will make sure to link all of her social platforms and where you can find her podcast in the show notes. But I appreciate you coming on Haley so much. And we will see you guys next time. Bye. If you were inspired by today's episode, I encourage you to tag me on social media at Kat Kamalani so I can personally thank you myself. I would love to hear your thoughts on my podcast. So go ahead and leave a review. So high five for finishing the episode and trying to better yourself. I hope you found it informative, inspiring, and thought provoking. I will see you again soon for another episode. Take care. Bye.